My name is Mark Christian. I work for a company called Airware. We are a drone data analytics company out of, based out of San Francisco, California, and we also have uh, an office in Paris, France. Uh, my background is I'm actually a geologist by profession. I worked in uh, hard rock gold, so in Nevada in the Carlin trend back in the late 90s, uh, and have been working with basically mapping data for most of my career. I'll hand it over to some of my colleagues. All right. My name is John Blackmore. I work with uh, Luxstone. We're an aggregate company out of Richmond, Virginia, and um, I've been with the company for about 22 or 22 for 11 years. And uh, <laughs> we have 22 operations. And um, my background is in surveying, mapping, and uh, geography. I'm Jason Hurtis with Caterpillar. I'm a global market professional for the quarrying aggregate segment, so I'm responsible for machines, product services, solutions, and technologies going into the quarrying aggregate market. Thank you. All right, so I'm just going to just talk. So here's your presenters. Um, just going to talk a little bit about Airware, essentially just what we do. And this is, I swear, this is the only uh, kind of marketing thing in the whole presentation. Uh, so. We uh, provide complete enterprise drone solutions, and what that means is basically the hardware and software, as well as services, professional services, to help an organization utilize this technology in their business. And um, we kind of break it up into two segments. We think about flying, kind of the field operations side, so collecting the data. And then we think about how do you take that imagery that's collected from a drone uh, process it and make it useful. So that's the analyzed part of the data. And We'll show you um, that at the Airware booth. If you stop by after the presentation, you can get an in-depth uh, demonstration around how you could use this technology in your business. A little bit on kind of what our solution platform does is we, as I said, take the data coming off the drone, you upload it to the cloud, and we process it to create essentially models and maps, and then do a whole series of analytics on that data from Inventory, so stockpile analytics, haul roads, so if you're looking at um, improving your site, the uh, haulage, uh, safety analytics for MSHAW compliance, and a, a variety of other things. So just, um, you know, why drones is kind of one of the things that I think a lot of people probably in this session are thinking about. And this uh, comes from McKinsey, and they're talking about, hey, Aggregate space, 28% less productive than a decade ago. Now, you know, there's a variety of reasons probably for that, but part of it has been slow adoption of technology. Construction's no different, and um, I, you know, whether you're looking at heavy civil construction or whether even you're looking at uh, commercial building construction, I mean, projects are taking 20% longer to finish, and they're generally over budget. And so this is really why this space is ripe for new technology. And um, what you'll see here is, this is also from McKinsey, is just the fact of like, kind of what are the actual costs associated with this um, essentially lack of productivity. And what you'll see here in North America, I think this thing has a laser pointer somewhere. Um, yeah. So in North America, we're, we're essentially, I mean, we're the largest uh, continent, right, when we're talking North America, but it's costing us the most compared to pretty much any other, any other country as far as um, lost economic value. And so because of that, there's a whole bunch of companies that are creating fabulous technology to help improve the work that we do, whether that is breaking rock out of the ground or whether that's actually, you know, putting down uh, pavement. So industry challenges, some of the things that I think about, I in my role, I get to travel around the country, uh, and I should say around North America primarily, and get to visit a lot of aggregate and uh, sand and mining companies and sites. And kind of this is what I see as, as I've uh, been traveling around this, over this last couple years, is you know, achieving operational excellence is something that I see as, as a challenge for the organization as a whole, right? Part of it is how do you actually understand when you are achieving operational excellence. So how do you, what are the metrics that you're using to measure the performance of your operation? Resource constraints, specifically in, in the aggregate space, I really see this. Every site I visit is uh, 
people have two jobs. The quarry manager is you know, not only managing the overall operation, but he's dealing with a whole bunch of other things too. It's, and it's a tight labor market. There's not a lot of new people necessarily coming into the market. So how do you attract some of the younger uh, you know, millennials or people coming out of, out of school? So this is where technology can help. And then uh, the other thing that I really see is this, this idea of consistent information for decision making. So if I think about mind planning specifically, you may have a corporate mind planning office, but how do you know that the people actually out in the site, that they may be in the middle of Texas, Brady, Texas, for example, or similar, how are they actually mining the plan, right? Are they using paper maps? How, how updated is, is that information? Do they even have some of the technology in their offices? So uh, mind planning software like SERPAC or similar. And usually the answer is no. Half the time in a lot of active facilities, you don't even have a GPS rover. So um, I think you know, these are the challenges that I see consistently across this space. Now, the digital revolution or, or right, technology, that's really what we're here to talk about today. And um, I guess the thing that I'd say is it's just, it is, requires a paradigm shift. And um, you know, I see this as I travel. A lot of the younger folks, especially coming out of college and mining engineers and similar, right? I mean, they're digital natives. They just expect things to be different. And so they look at the old way of doing things, paper maps, even going out and topoing a site as kind of prehistoric almost, or it's just not the way things should be done today. Um, you know, what we really want to see, or what, what they expect, is this to embrace cloud computing. So the ability to have you know, data at your fingertips, um, leverage the resource of the cloud to process and analyze data, uh, integration with other types of systems, so essentially, you know, easy, easy, the easy button. Things should be, it shouldn't be a complicated workflow, it should be an easy workflow to move from, say, mine planning data into ERP and um, managing, say, your sales uh, numbers. And other things around, like, monitoring safety. I mean, you'll see this from Caterpillar, a whole bunch of innovation around safety, whether that's video or cameras inside the cab to monitor a, a, a driver, are they nodding or are they, are they blinking, um, to some of the analytics that can be derived from drone data. So because of that, there's a whole bunch of technology in this space and um, you know, whether it's, so I, I worked a, a lot in kind of civil engineering and heavy civil projects, so VDC, virtual design and construction, is not new. But it's something that every large project is being done today, or if you've heard of a term called building, building information modeling. I mean, the information that's designed essentially in the office, right, is now there, that digital data is being used out in the field to construct and manage these jobs. And whether it's project management, whether it's just viewing drawing files and 3D models, doing things like clash detection, um, when they're actually building complicated infrastructure with a lot of utilities, field type calculators, uh, punch lists. I mean, that's one of the ones that I'm seeing being adopted re really broadly is, is punch lists for safety and, and uh, sign off. And if you just saw in the latest aggregates manager um, magazine, Imshaw has now just released a new mobile app for their inspectors when they're going on site. So, you know, instead of working with a computer camera, Flipboard, now they basically have a mobile app they're using for, for site safety. So, I mean, this is happening today, and obviously you're in here because you're here to learn about it. Um, so just a little bit about drone technology and just kind of where, where we've come. So I've been working in the drone space for three years now, and let me tell you, from where we sit today to compare to where we were three years ago is drastically different. And a lot of it has come around the hardware space. So uh, this little drone that you see here, many of you may see that. Maybe if you have kids, they may have one of these. It's uh, from a company called DJI. They're the world leader in drones out of China. And really, the, the, the news is that this, the drone technology is now reliable and safe enough to use for commercial purposes. And this is not just you know, commercial grade uh, hardware. This is consumer grade hardware. I mean, this drone here is $1,200. You can buy it at Best Buy. It has a 20 megapixel camera on it. 
and for mapping and surveying type purposes for aggregates and, and construction, it's absolutely fantastic. So hardware is here today, it's reliable and low cost. Um, the flight planning software. So this, this now has really evolved. Almost everything is done on, an, on, a, on a mobile app. So an iOS device or an Android device, there are still some drones that you'll fly with a laptop. But just the flight planning is so much easier. Um, essentially, it's you know, pick a few clicks, uh, move a few slider bars, and essentially you're off and running. So the other thing to think about is the actual software itself. So we can take a lot of imagery with a drone, but how do you actually process that and turn it into usable information? There are a lot of options out there on the market today. You can do desktop processing with a high-end laptop or a workstation computer. But really the thing that's, that's happened over the last three years is the evolution of the cloud and cloud computing specifically for photogrammetry, which is essentially the process of how we take individual images from drones and turn it into a 3D, 3D models and maps or, or, or topos. Um, and it's all in a browser. So there's really nothing to install on a desktop. So that means you can have a, essentially a low-end computer to access this data or access it on, on a mobile device. And then finally is, is the regulation piece. Uh, so just in 2016, the end of 2016, the FAA essentially a, approved commercial purposes under, under a, a rule set called Part 107. And essentially what this did, this, this has enabled all of us to be able to use this technology to collect data. You don't have to be a manned aircraft pilot anymore. You essentially have to take an exam. It's uh, equivalent to a driver's test. And it's really around understanding airspace and some of the rules of the road that a, that a pilot would know. And then um, the operations are, have also improved. So there's a, a, a great waiver process now. So before you couldn't fly in restricted airspace, so close to an airport, for example. Now you actually can. Um, there are some restrictions around that, and the FAA has a waiver process, but everything has just been made a lot easier, but specifically around just becoming a pilot or what they call a remote pilot. Um, so when you look at the FAA's uh, registered database of use cases, uh, what you'll see here, construction and mining are the second major application. So, I mean, everybody's doing this today. What, as I've traveled around, and I don't care if it's you know, a large publicly traded company or a small family owned business, I'd say most people have at least started thinking or experimenting with UAVs. Uh, some companies are actually have them, in, have adopted them and really put them into production. It's part of their surveying and mapping um, process now. And just a little bit on the, on the drone hardware. So I mentioned it earlier, there's basically these multi-rotor type UAVs, and then there's a fixed wing or, or what look like a plane. And there are some you know, really distinct differences between them. And what I'll say is you know, think about what you're trying to do, the use case, and um, some, of the, some of the constraints that you have on site. So uh, the multi-rotor aircraft, really easy to operate. And you essentially vertical takeoff and landing. So if you don't have a large area to, to land a plane like this, uh, the multi-rotor aircraft work really well. I would say these are a lot more approachable, uh, especially from uh, a newcomer to flying UAVs. And um, there's a lot of options on here. And you can, in this, this particular one you see on screen here, has the ability to swap out what's called the payload or the sensor. So you can use high resolution cameras, you can use thermal imaging cameras, and so a lot of flexibility with this type of aircraft. It can also be used for other use cases. You can do inspection type work with it too, because it can essentially sit and hover and you can uh, move the camera because it's on a gimbal. This type of aircraft over here is, is really designed for one purpose, and that's to map, to, to basically do survey and mapping type work. And uh, John from Luxstone will talk a little bit about, about how they're using these two types of aircraft in, in their uh, operations. So, you know, the, the thing that I get excited about is, is less about the hardware side of things. It's really about the data and the deliverables that can be created from, from the UAV. 
And um, just kind of running through these really quickly is, and so we take all these imagery, all the images, individual images, upload it to the cloud or process it on the desktop, and we create some outputs. Uh, you'll get basically aerial imagery or an ortho mosaics, uh, true color ortho mosaics. You'll get a surface model. So through photogrammetry, we essentially, when we map uh, the, a site, we're going to get everything in the surface model. We're going to get structures, equipment, vegetation. Um, so it, it's, it's a surface model. It's not a DTM, a terrain model, which is essentially bare earth. Uh, 3D models for visualization purposes. And these can be in the form of a point cloud, or they can be what's called a textured mesh. And, and not to fill you with a bunch of jargon, but um, just to kind of help you understand some of the terminology. Um, you know, you can pull stockpiles. This is one of the, I would say, first use cases in the aggregate space in using UAVs is really around inventory control and measuring volumes. And so there's a bunch of tools available. Airware um, has some fantastic technology around stockpile reporting, and, but this data can be extracted essentially from the 3D surface models, 3D model and surface models. Topo, elevation contours. I mean, for mine planning, that's a, you know, usually what we want. We want some elevation contours, and we're going to use them in a tool like Surpac or MapTech Vulcan or similar. And then you can do a whole bunch of other things. So cut and fill reporting, so pay quantity work. Fantastic use for UAV, especially when we're looking at uh, larger earthwork type projects, so uh, corridor type work, or um, if you're doing a, a whole stripping on your site and you have contractors doing stripping, this is where the cut and fill maps are really fantastic. Isocore maps, so thickness maps around what was removed. And then thermal imagery. And this, there's a whole host of applications from thermal imagery, from inspecting rooftops to um, looking at uh, when you poured concrete and looking at how, how concrete is um, essentially setting up. So. And, and more and more applications in thermal imagery to come. I think we're just really scratching the surface around thermal imagery. So just uh, to think about what can we do with a drone, you know, I, the questions I usually get are, hey, around the resolution of the data, and how long does it take to do this? So this is just an example um, of some times. And this is including setup. This is not just flight time. So in about an hour, you can map about 140 acres. And that is with, uh, that would, in this specific example, that'd be with that fixed wing aircraft. But with a, a multi-rotor aircraft, you can do anywhere between 100, or 80 and 120 acres on a battery, which is 25 minutes. We have some setup and whatnot. But about an hour, you know, up to 140 acres. And you can see here, so, you know, half a day, you can, you can essentially do 560 acres. Uh, I've actually been on site with one of our pilots and we were, we were mapping a site. We did 2,000 acres in a day. It was a 10 hour day, but it's possible. Um, not something I'd want to do every day. But. And just a, a little bit of that surveying comparison. And I think, you know, not to go through all of this here, but the time is, is greatly reduced. And the thing to think about is the resolution of the data. So basically the points that you get on a per square meter or, or per square foot basis. This is really where the, the photogrammetry um, has a lot of value, is the vertical accuracy may not be as good as what you can do with a terrestrial total station or similar. But because the resolution is so much higher, you actually get a, a, a more complete model. And I think the, the big thing here is you know safety, right? We, we always think about safety. and just really with adequate training and um, a proper standard operating procedures, I would say you know, there's next to no safety uh, hazards when using UAVs compared to traditional methods where you're basically walking on uneven terrain um, out in the way of potential of equipment and other things. Um, just to think about some of the use cases here, is it's a lot more than inventory control. So, you know, whether it's exploration, planning, and blasting. I mean, there's a whole host of things here. And I think what we've seen uh, a lot of our customers doing, land acquisition. So looking at whether it's a new greenfield type site or whether it's actually doing an acquisition of an existing operation is before you may have ordered a manned aircraft um, survey. 
But now with a UAV, you can essentially go collect that data over site very quickly and have it at your fingertips really within a matter of hours. And it gives you, you know, the topography and the structures and other, other things that uh, I just talked about earlier. Uh, stripping. This is one of the use cases that I'm seeing people really embrace is just for stripping volumes and, and also for uh, pay quantities I had mentioned. But I think a lot more than just the 3D uh, models. I also think about the ortho mosaics. They have a lot of value in just managing basically contractors, especially if you're more on the construction side in the um, kind of on the, say road construction, paving and whatnot really looking at what is being completed um, just from project progress it has a lot of value. And blasting, a lot of people now are actually starting to use UAVs for blast design. So fly a bench and you can process that data really quickly. You can have it really within 30 minutes or less and um, use that updated model to actually do your blast planning. And then post-blast um, management, looking at the muck pile or filming the actual blast. So having one of those hovercraft and filming the blast so you can look at fragmentation. So a lot of uses for UAVs in kind of the early phases of a project. Uh, haulage, this is some of the work that we're doing with Caterpillar specifically, is taking the 3D model and actually doing, using it for job site analysis. So looking at grades of the roads, looking at the crossfall, so how's it sloped for drainage, uh, super elevation in a curve, for example. Um, and you, know, you can start looking at some of the things, if you, if you fly low enough and get high, high resolution of data, you can actually start looking at actually some of the road conditions, not just in the, in the picture, but actually in the surface model, you can actually start seeing areas where there's ponding or potential for ponding and pooling. Um, and integration of, of other sensor data with the 3D models that are created from a UAV or through the photogrammetry process. So bringing in basically machine telematics to help monitor your equipment on a real-time map or up-to-date map instead of using an outdated, say, uh, Google-type map. So a, a lot of things that can be done here on, on the hauling side. And as I mentioned before, just if you come by the Airware booth, I'm happy to show you how, how you could use some of this data to, for these applications. Inventory, I mean, this is the one that I'd say, this is what pays for the UAV program usually, is uh, the inventory control. And so um, whether it's you do it in-house or whether you have a third party come out and fly, or um, you may have had some of the other firms that have been using, uh, say, terrestrial or, or land-based uh, survey methods. Many of them now are moving to drone-based methods, mainly because it's faster and, and oftentimes it can be more accurate. And then safety environmental. I mean, this is uh, safety, as I mentioned before. Using the data and, and doing some of the analytics on the data, you can do it in some desktop tools. But this is really where the power of the cloud has come and, Airware, and companies like Airware are really saying, hey, how do we collect data over a site um, and you know, apply useful analytics that really help with decision making. And the safety piece is a big one around berming and blocking. So you can actually measure your berm heights and your block heights, understand where are you out of compliance uh, if you are. And then you know, there's a whole bunch of work happening around habitat monitoring. So just looking at changes in vegetation over time, especially when you're on the exploration side, that's where I spent quite a bit of time out in Nevada is doing exploration. And uh, essentially, when we had to cover our tracks, right, leave, leave the site like it was undisturbed. So, you know, how do you prove that the site that you just went and did a bunch of drilling on is, is actually, you've reclaimed it properly? So, uh, lots of uses here just around that community relations, giving people an idea of what actually happens at the quarry. What does the quarry look like? Most, most uh, quarry sites are pretty close to... Uh, you know, residential uh, uh, infrastructure. So, you know, you've got neighbors, and what do they hear? They hear the noise, and they hear the dust, and they see the dust, and that's what you maybe get complaints about, or the truck traffic, right? So I think this is where there's a, a lot of power in, in using drones to help educate uh, people that aren't in this industry around what do we actually do and um, some of the measures that we go through to improve environmental conditions. 
Um, just some use cases. And, and what I'll say is, um, you know, pouring, I'd say the big one here is stockpile inventory surveys. This is where, as I mentioned, most people start, usually uh, done on a quarterly or monthly basis. And um, this is where I, I, I see them. This pays usually for getting your drone program started. Um, mining, what you'll see in the, in, the, in the mining site, so when we're talking large metal mines and similar, is there are many, many applications. Um, everybody has volumetrics as far as whether it's measuring tailings, uh, waste dumps, whether it's uh, measuring the stockpiles from production, but blast planning, environmental, um, and what we're seeing in the mining space is just the frequency is a lot higher. Drones are being adopted in mining and they're really being flown on a daily basis. These are a tool that are essentially in the surveyor's toolkit. And oftentimes they have multiple surveyors on a, on a large site that maybe have many pits. And each one has, has a drone that they'll be using. And construction is where we're seeing on, on the large earthwork projects is really around um, monitoring of pay quantities and construction progress. And that's usually done on a weekly basis. So, and, and John will talk a little bit more about that. So with that, I'm going to hand it to uh, John Blackmore from Luxstone, and he'll tell you a little bit about Luxstone's journey and how they're using drones. Great. Thanks, Mark. <clears throat> uh, just so I can get a little bit of a feel for who's in the room, if your company's currently flying drones, raise your hand. OK. Uh, part 107 pilots? OK, cool. Good. What is that? You're in the right place to figure that out. Um, <clears throat> OK, uh, so just real briefly, a little uh, quick overview about Luxstone and who we are. Uh, Luxstone is a privately owned, uh, family owned company uh, based out of Richmond, Virginia. We've been around since 1923. Um, you know, we have some distribution yards down in the eastern um, coast of, of Virginia, but most of our quarrying operations are northern Virginia and central Virginia. Uh, like I mentioned, the company is family owned um, and you know, we have in our mission and our vision this phrase about igniting human potential. And um, you know, part of that is around like encouraging others and encouraging people in our organization uh, to be leaders. We feel like we're leaders in this space. Uh, Luxstone's got a history of innovation, a history of, um, of technology. You know, we started some digital ticketing of our scales back in the 70s. Um, plant automation, we've been leaders in the electronics and the automation of our plant equipment. And as well, more recently, um, uh, done some work around remote control operations, including remote control loaders, and obviously we're here to talk about drones. So Mark asked me to come and speak just to kind of a little bit about how Luxstone went through this process, how did we get here, and then, then our, our involvement together. So I did this with a little bit of a timeline of kind of where we got into drones, how we started this program, and, uh, and then leading up to today. So Mark mentioned one of the biggest paybacks is around uh, the inventory process, managing our stockpiles. And so historically, as a company, Luxstone has done this a lot of different ways. Um, there, we might have somebody stand out there, and this is you know, maybe back in the 80s, we'd have somebody stand out there with a lock level maybe a, a grade rod trying to adjust heights or estimate heights and um, maybe drawing some sketches of piles and to try to understand how big that, that pile is. Uh, we graduated to doing that with uh, some ground surveys and then we hired a, uh, an airplane to start doing that uh, in the 90s, I believe it was. But that requires a lot of information, a lot of back and forth from the plant. Uh, you can see here, here's two, two of our managers sitting down at a table with some paper copy maps. They're taking Sharpies out. They're trying to draw and figure out which pile is where and look at, look at that. So I came on in 2006 and saw that as a quick opportunity of like, how do we use imagery better? How do we use technology and make this process easier? So created a web application where we're basically taking that imagery, uh, hosting that imagery, and then getting that information, that back and forth from the sites uh, to uh, get that information back to us. So I started seeing in the you know, conference proceedings and, and industry newsletters and that sort of thing about, about drones and, and UAVs, mostly outside of the US. Um, but it sort of piqued this interest in, hey, you know, this is related to imagery. This is a process that we already have. Maybe we could use this technology to do that better. 
So in 2013, I have here Eric hired. Uh, Eric, I'll talk a little bit more about him in a minute, but Eric is our, our current pilot. Eric does all of the flying for Luxstone. He's a full-time pilot. Um, and he started in one of our quarry operations uh, as an equipment operator. Um, he was, was very interested in technology. Um, he was, you know, came to Luxstone with an interest in drones, an interest in, in technology, and started to figure out how can I use this to do my job better. So interestingly enough, in 2014, we actually, as a company, sponsored a triathlon event called the Xterra Games. And the Xterra Games, um, if you're familiar with triathlons, a triathlon is a run, bike, and swim. And so the uh, contestants go out and run, they go out and swim, and they go out and they bike, and they come back. Well, we were a sponsor of that event, and we were challenged to bring technology to this event. So how do you, how do you put on you know, a sponsorship for this event, and everybody leaves the sponsor area. So somebody came up with the idea, hey, what if we had a drone, and we took our cell phone, and we duct taped it to the drone, and we turned on an app like Ustream or, or Livestream, and put that drone up in the air, and stream that technology, stream that video back to the sponsor tent. Maybe we bring that event to the, spon to the sponsor tent. So we did that. It was kind of an interesting thing. Things sometimes don't always go well when you use duct tape to hold things together. Um, but it was a good opportunity for us to challenge that technology. How do we how do we do something different? Uh, the best part about that was now that now Luxstone owns a drone. So in 2014, you know, Eric is still working at the at the quarry. I'm in the engineering group. I'm trying to figure out you know the regulatory side of this. How do we do this as a company? Uh, Eric is at the at the uh, the quarry site running the rail loadout, and he decides that he's going to use a drone to start inspecting the rail cars. Uh, he really championed some of our early uh, inspection work of instead of having somebody climb up and down that ladder, just fly a drone over, take a video of it, go sit down, look at the video, and then address things that need to be looked at. From a, a regulatory perspective. Uh, we filed what was called the 333 exemption, and I promise I won't go into the great gory details of that with the FAA, um, but essentially what that was is a, we were asking the FAA for exemptions from existing airplane rules. For example, 91.205 says you have to have seat belts in an airplane. Anyone in the room ridden on an airplane before? They do the flight briefing where they you know, tell you how to use a seat belt. Well, our drones don't have seat belts. So we literally had like a 15 or 20 page document to the FAA saying, please exempt us from the seatbelt rule. Please exempt us from the rule that says we need to carry logbooks. Please exempt us from this rule. So part of that, um, that exemption uh, process was the requirement to actually have a pilot, a real licensed pilot, fly drones. Uh, so in February 2016, um, Eric and I went to pilot school and we learned how to fly real airplanes so we could bring that technology, bring that ability back to Luxstone to be able to fly drones. Um, around that same time, I think it was in March or so of 2016, uh, through our relationship with Caterpillar, we were introduced to Redbird, uh, now Airware, and you know that we have a long-standing relationship with Caterpillar. And Cat came to us and said, hey, you need to check this out. Uh, Airware's got some great tools for, uh, you know, very mining specific analytics and uh, so we, we started that relation, relationship with them. Uh, the FAA came out with the Part 107 later that year <coughs> in 2016 and I started adding months to this timeline because things started happening quicker. Um, we, Eric and I started working together more. Uh, I was spending a lot of time processing data I was spending a, a whole lot of time where I would be out flying, and then my computer was sitting somewhere else crunching away at the data, and I'd come back, and I'd, you know, this, this balancing act of, of trying to figure out the data processing and the flying. Um, you know, around this time, you know, Mark mentioned earlier that, uh, that, that, that the people coming into the workforce now are digital natives, they're expecting technology. And Eric and I started working together a lot, and Eric stood up and he said, hey, I'm really interested in doing more with drones. I want to do more. I want to be part of the engineering group. I want to, I want to do this full time. Is that something we could do? Um, so I, I saw that opportunity. I started working and trying to figure out, you know, do we have enough workload? Do we have enough 
um, demand for this product for imagery, for contours, for inspections to really justify a full-time position, and we did. Uh, so in December of 16, we created a full-time position for a pilot in our engineering group, and uh, his name's Eric. If you ever see him, he's about this tall, and he has a big beard. He's hard to miss. Um, but it, it reminds me, uh, Charles Luck, who's being inducted into the Hall of Fame tonight, um, you know, recently had a quote that said, um, Luxon has always had a mindset of treating people right. Uh, our greatest asset is our people, and people have asked him over the years why we've been successful as, a, as, a, as we've been, and he said it was simple. It's about the people that we work for us. And this is really a true statement. You know, Eric didn't want to be an equipment operator for the rest of his life. He said, I want to do more. I want to be part of the drone program, and we were able to do that. So in April of uh, 2017, we officially signed a, a deal with, with the folks at Airware uh, and really have been you know, on the upswing since then. The, um, we were able to do our first company-wide inventory that is all drones uh, in May of last year. So historically, I mentioned we did that inventory process with uh, manned aircraft flying and getting that imagery back and forth. And last year, we did that um, completely with drones. We've been able to take that process from a biannual, twice a year process to a quarterly process for essentially the same cost. So we're getting twice as much data. Uh, we're getting four, time, four measurements a year where we're getting all of our sites uh, measured. And then I have the future. Uh, we don't know where the future is going to go, but it's going to be great. Uh, I got an email from AOPA yesterday that just had just the different sectors, public safety, uh, someone in Florida used a drone to save a person's life. Somebody here used a drone to measure this. I mean, we know the future is, uh, is going to be happening with drones. So specific to some of our other uh, usage, you know, at, at Luxton, I mentioned the stockpile management, <coughs> the stripping volume, and, and the pay quantities that Mark had mentioned. Uh, we're also using drones for pit analysis and design and operational efficiency. Some of the tools that Airware brings uh, around haul road analytics and, and performance data, uh, that's what we're really looking into. You know, drones are just good for marketing pictures. Uh, they, they just, they, uh, they get a different, different perspective. Uh, we've also been using drones for safety inspections. Uh, Mark mentioned the different types of aircraft. We have four aircraft. Um, we have a few of the hovercraft type uh, aircraft and then one fixed wing aircraft that flies more like a plane. Um, we've had some great wins with our safety inspections. Uh, we do an in internal annual uh, um, safety inspection at all of our sites, and we bring people from different locations to one site uh, for that inspection. And we've now integrated the drone as part of that to get out, take pictures, uh, take some, some imagery uh, as well as some video, and then we, we sit down together and look at that and try to find things. We've had some really significant wins uh, in that area. And we've integrated uh, our, our drone program into that this year. Okay, so as far as stockpile management uh, goes, you know, I, I had mentioned this before, you know, this process is time sensitive. Uh, we were historically doing this with a web application. Uh, we were asking that plant manager, hey, log into this website. Your imagery is there. Go in there and click. Create those piles. Go circle the 57 pile. Go circle the 8 pile. Label that pile what it is. Tell us what it is. Um, and then they would let us know. You know, now that we're using Airware, that, uh, that imagery and the pile, uh, the pile locations are actually generated through machine learning. So the, their software goes through, looks for that toe of the pile, and identifies uh, the footprint of the pile. And then now we're asking our management to go in and say, hey, just tell me what that is. We know it's a pile, just go in there and tell us what it is. Uh, so that makes things a, a lot quicker. We're getting a lot faster return. Um, you know, I mentioned we have sites all over Virginia. When we were doing this process with, uh, with manned aircraft, we would basically tell the pilot, hey, we want to fly October 1. And they would say, great, thanks. Well, it's cloudy. So then it's uh, rainy in northern Virginia. Well, then there's fog down in North Carolina. So sometimes it might be as, as late as October 10th, 12th, 13th uh, before they would fly uh, because they're trying to get a manned aircraft up in the air, fly all of our sites at once, and then land. Uh, with the drone, yes, we do have to go to every site, 
uh, but we're able to, to rearrange on the fly and be a lot more nimble with how we, how we uh, accomplish all those flights. I uh, also mentioned the, you know, the, the quarter, quarterly measurements. We're doing this process four times a year now, uh, and that has been, been great for just having more information. This is the age of having more information. We're doing that. So next up, you know, around the, the pay quantities and, and stripping projects, you know, we're rock experts. We're not dirt experts. And so we, uh, we typically hire out most of our, our stripping and, and uh, dirt moving uh, work. We've done that, again, a lot of different ways. Sometimes we would just take the contractor's word for it. We would, we would talk about it. Maybe we would do a little bit of measuring on our own and just say, hey, we think that's reasonable. Go ahead. Uh, sometimes the, the contractor might have a surveyor, and we would just take their numbers. Uh, occasionally we would hire surveyors or, or work it into the contract where we would both agree to have that measured uh, during or after the project. Uh, now with Airware, you know, we're doing that frequently on our own. We've written that into our contracts with our stripping contractors to do monthly flights or maybe do a, a beginning, middle, and end flight uh, to, to understand that. Um, you know, thinking about the safety side of this and just the amount of data, you know, when we would send, uh, if we did a GPS survey, if anyone's ever been around a stripping uh, operation, those guys get paid by the yard. So the, the faster they move, the better their day is. Uh, that excavator boom is swinging. You've got trucks cycling. Uh, you've got graders rolling through. And so we've got, you know, one of us out there with a GPS rover trying to get, you know, spot shots uh, while you have all this going on. Um, maybe in four or five hours you're getting a couple hundred points. You're trying to get points at the toe and the crest of, of features. Like in this example, you'd want to walk along the toe and the crest to, co to go back to the office and make that you might even have to ask them to stop for a minute to get around there and, and GPS that. Uh, with this technology, with the drone, we're able to fly in, uh, get that, all that information, and we're getting millions of points in about half an hour versus a couple hundred points uh, in several hours. We're taking that person out of, the, um, out of that dangerous situation. So we've also had, we've had some, uh, a couple of discrepancies with some of our contractors in the last couple of years. And so we've had uh, several, uh, several of those contractors said, hey, let's, let's go out. I, I want to interrogate that a little bit. Like, maybe I don't fully understand this drone. Like, what are you doing taking pictures? So we actually went out with one of our, uh, one of our projects, and we said, okay, if you want to challenge our results here, you show us where you want us to GPS. So we went out. We took the GPS, and we walked around and took a bunch of spot shots. And it's a little hard to see on the screen, but you can see some of the spot shots here um, in our model. And we compared that to the terrain that was developed uh, through this photogrammetry process. And it gave us actionable data to sit down at a table with the contractor and say, hey, look, I know it, maybe it doesn't feel right to you, but here's what we found in the field. Here's what we measured with the GPS. Here's what we measured with the drone. And they all look the same. So you're not done stripping yet. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> Keep going. Um, but that, uh, that has been some really, really big wins in, in that department for us. Okay, um, last use case here that I'm going to cover is around uh, our pit analysis and, and pit design. Um, you know, one of our objectives in the mining engineering group or the quarry design group is around just maximizing our reserves, but also maximizing our safe reserves. Um, so we do, uh, we do some work internally around trying to understand uh, where we need to put roads, where do we need to, um, to develop our high walls differently, um, and we can really get a lot better information using the drone. Uh, each of our sites has some standards as far as like how far is the berm from the haul road, how far is the berm from, uh, from the high wall, obviously MSHA, and uh, local mining regulations also have some... some uh, some say in that as well, um, but you know, historically we would go out with a, either a profiler or something like a total station, and we would sit on the ground and we would shoot points, you know, along that profile and try to understand is this wall safe. Uh, we might do that on several, um, several locations, cross sections down the wall, um, and now with the drone information, you know, we're able to get all of that data 
by doing it on the ground, sometimes you get these shadows where you can't actually see uh, part of the bench. Doing it from the air, you're getting a, a much more complete data set. <clears throat> so I think this might take a second. So this is uh, one of our pits that we did a recent study on. And you can see here, this is the rendering of the 3D point cloud that came from that. So we were actually analyzing this wall here. And so we cut 11 cross sections through that wall. Uh, and really we were trying to design where that haul road was going to go at the base of that pit, or the base of that wall. So a lot of things we can tell from this rendering. We can look at catch benches that, are, uh, that have material on them, maybe look at, at uh, things we need to do to try to understand uh, how to make that safer for that travel way down at the, at the bottom. And there, here's a, you know, just a demonstration of those cross sections. Um, you know, our engineers use a, a rockfall analysis program. So we're basically taking those cross sections. Um, if you were doing that from the ground with a terrestrial gun, whether that's a profiler or a um, total station, your profile might look something like that. Um, you know, again, with the drone data, we're getting hundreds, maybe even thousands of points on that profile to do that analysis much more thorough. Uh, the software takes, you know, theoretical rocks, throws it off the, the cliff. Uh, in this simulation, it was um, about 4,000 rocks that were thrown off the cliff to understand where we want to put that berm at the bottom for the maximum safety, but also maximizing our reserves. You know, using the, um, the drone, whether that's in the 3D model or in just you know, plain imagery, uh, we're also able to look at those catch benches. You can see very clearly we have material that fell down into that you know, proposed travel way, uh, and it very clearly correlates to having full catch benches. You know, it's another simple example of where drones give you a different perspective of what you've always seen and maybe not realize what it was there. So for us, in this particular design, uh, where we put that berm and where we put that haul road uh, led to a million tons in final reserves in that pit. Um, so that's, a, that's a, a very big win for us as far as you know, maximizing those safe reserves using this technology. So you know, just real briefly in closing, a couple of the things that I wanted to mention, just like you know, some of the lessons that we learned, some of the things that you should be looking at if you're, you're looking to get into this technology. You know, there's a lot of different options. There's, uh, there's some do-it-yourself options. There's, uh, there's different companies that are offering services. There's different ways to do that. Uh, as far as the ground control and the survey question, you know, fortunately for Luxstone, all of our sites are in areas of, of good cell, cell phone coverage. Uh, we did some early testing with the VRS network, which is a, a cell phone-based correction service. Um, and we are outfitted to do PPK work, um, but we have found really good success with VRS. That's not always the case. If you're in remote uh, you know, Tennessee somewhere and, and uh, long ways from cell towers, that may not work for you. So that's definitely something to look, look into. I mentioned the ground control. We started um, early on with doing ground control on all of our flights. Uh, we also did ground control checkpoints, and then we would check model, uh, check our model to that. And we finally basically got to the point that we said, hey, this is close enough for us, for the work that we're doing, um, for the volumes that we're, that we're, um, we're measuring, this works. And, and we made the decision to not use ground control. There are still occasionally times that we do that to further refine our model, but in general, we rely on, on the VRS uh, for that positioning. Um, I mentioned, I want to mention, you know, continuous improvement. You know, um, this industry is moving fast, and you have to stay current. There's always new sensors. There's always new aircraft. The FAA is changing their regulations. Um, you know, at Luxton, there, we've had a lot of support to try things that don't work. I've crashed a couple of aircraft. You know, that costs money. Um, but you've got to have leadership in place that's going to understand that, hey, it may not go right all the time. Um, but most of the time, it does go right. Um, uh, but that leadership needs to understand that, you know, hey, let's try this. And, and sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it, it does. Um, I mentioned, you know, just going back to that igniting potential, you know, the investment is not just in the technology. It's also in the people. And you need people that are bought into this. You need people that understand the technology, but they're also willing to go the extra mile 
that are willing to go to things like this and, and talk and get out and, and understand what else is out there in the industry um, uh, to learn more. It takes a champion. So probably a recurring theme here. Um, this, because it's changing, because of the FAA rules, um, because of you know, you know, the, some of the airspace situations that Luxstone deals with, uh, we have a few operations around Dulles International. Uh, that's an interesting place to fly a drone, but we have waivers to fly in that area. You need somebody that can really you know, monitor those conditions, have relationships with local airports, and understand what that means, and, and radio frequencies, and air, airport operations, and, and all that uh, things uh, near your site. And then lastly, uh, Luxone has been successful in implementing uh, some business objectives uh, this, this year for us that are using drone data to help make better decisions. So we have a couple of projects in place, uh, in, including looking at our haul roads and our uh, berm designs at our, at our plants. And um, you know, we're going to evaluate and install and look at more technology to continue doing that well. But we've also made that commitment by putting it in the business plan and putting it in so it's measurable. And it's something that we can go back and look at and see grade ourselves on how we did. I think that is my last slide. There we go. Yep, that's it. So we'll be around afterwards. Uh, if you got any questions, Jason's up. So you're probably wondering why is a construction equipment manufacturer in this particular class? Caterpillar does not make drones. I want to clarify that now. Five years ago, when we started in this business, we did make a drone. Came in two great big Pelican boxes, had the same durability as all of our machines, and it had a whopping flight time of four minutes. If anybody's interested in it, my wife would really like it out of my garage, so let me know. Well, we quickly learned that drones complement our machines. We started looking at it because we wanted to complement the productivity uh, statements that we have with our particular machines. So we started in the stockpile area because our machines were working in the pit, bringing the material up. We'd have technology on our machine, scales, payload systems. But then we wanted to verify what was coming out the other end of the plant to, again, prove to the customer that our machines were more productive. So that's how we started in the, in the stockpile business. We weren't really interested from, from a cost or an inventory standpoint. We were more interested in it from the, the tons or the production per hour. From there, it progressed into the whole haul road. We do site analysis, we have uh, site solution services where we'll come out, we'll profile your entire site, tell you what machines would be the best ones for the efficiency that you want, the fuel burn that you're gonna need, and the production requirements that you want. In the past, we put people on your haul roads, walking right next to your haul trucks, measuring with lasers or GPS, and it would take us two to three days. Now with a drone, we can fly your entire site, plus we can get all the, the crossfalls, we can get all the elevations, a lot quicker, a lot safer, and a lot more efficient than what we could in the past. And again, then we can model all that and tell you what would be the best machine fleet for your particular application. From there, we then move that in-house. So all of our internal production studies that are done at Caterpillar are all measured with a drone. That's where all of our volumetrics are coming from now. So when you look at a Caterpillar brochure or anybody's brochure and it says, this machine moves X tons in an hour, all that volumetric from Caterpillar has been done with a drone because it's faster, you get a lot more data points, and it's a lot more accurate than you could with a rover or somebody saying, it looks like we moved 15 tons out of that trench today. So we're using it for internal production studies as well to enhance our machine, to enhance our designs, and help our NPI programs. Site maintenance. A lot of our facilities, whether it's a manufacturing facility, one of our test facilities, are under the same requirements that you guys are under. You're regulated by EPA, you have waterways, you, can, you have dust control. We have those same issues as a manufacturer. So we're using drones for our site maintenance. Um, also site maintenance on your particular site for high wall verification based off the size of the trucks that you have, runoff, all that can be done with a drone. Again, quicker, safer, and easier. Same with environmental monitoring. Again, as I mentioned with the EPA, we're next to some rivers, we're next to creeks, waterways, you have to monitor that before we'd have to send people out to walk through all that, survey it. Sometimes they couldn't get to the places because the water was high, whatever. Now again, you can fly it all with a drone, it's a lot quicker and easier. We looked at different analytic companies in the past. Um, actually, we looked at all of them. 
Um, and we have partnered with Airware just because of the speed of analytics. It's all cloud-based, so you fly, you upload it to the cloud. Depending on your site, how much data you have, within an hour, sometimes the next day, you have your complete site profile out. And then from there, it's, the sky's the limit, really. I mean, do you want 3D renderings? Do you want just your haul roads? Do you want to change your haul road? Do you want to know what that looks like? What are your cut and fills for construction, which is the market that we're really getting pulled into now? Construction sites want to fly in the morning and in the afternoon. And they want to be able to verify how much production or how much material was actually moved. You fly a site before you get your cut and fill data, then you can use that for your 3D grade control in a lot of the machines. Again, making it quicker, easier, and safer for validation and for the, the production of the machines that you paid for. I'll hand it back to Mark. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> so just to touch on a few points uh, you know, that John and, and Jason mentioned, I mean, I think the, the big thing here is around you know, starting a drone program. From the raise of hands, it sounds like you know, they're, they're widely in use. Um, what I've seen is, you know, there's companies that have really embraced this technology, like Lux Stone, have put resources behind it, and I think you know that really comes from the top around this idea around, around hey, we invest in people and we need to innovate, and we're going to try things, and some things may fail, but we're going to have a lot of successes coming out of this. And this just is, you know, requires a change in mindset, especially in I would say in in our industry, in the aggregates industry, right? We're very cost sensitive and oftentimes have been, um, let's say, a little reluctant to uh, try things that, that may have a cost associated with them. So, you know, oftentimes you needed to show the benefit right up front before you could get a sign-off. Um, so this just requires a, a really a, a change in mindset, and, and, you know, if you're um, a manager of a site or you're in a leadership-type position, I mean, this is the thing that I'd say that you can impart or bring to your organization that's going to help you be more competitive uh, in the environment and really, um, you know, foster this culture of innovation. It's going to help with attracting new talent and retaining employees. I mean, uh, Luckstone's a great example. It took a truck driver here that had really a passion for drones and technology, and now they're part of the engineering group. So he essentially has, you know, he's got a job that was never there before. Um, and so we're, we're seeing that happen, not just in the aggregates industry, but in, in multiple industries. So... Um, and so, you know, don't think about incremental change. Uh, you know, you got to start somewhere, and usually inventory is where I've seen most people in this industry starting. But, you know, as John is demonstrating, as Jason has mentioned, from, you know, the way Caterpillar is using uh, drones both in their um, basically job site assessments, but also in house managing some of their proving grounds, it's really going beyond this in incremental usage. It's really saying, hey, what else can we do with this? And, and let's uh, experiment innovate. And what I want to do is just say, you know, getting started, I mean, from the show of hands, it sounds like a lot of things are started. I don't know how, you know, company-wide that is, but um, some of the things that I've really seen as kind of recipes for success is, John mentioned it, you need an owner and a champion, and, and this is, you know, it's new technology. There's going to be a lot of people that will be naysayers. They'll say, there's no way you can do that fast enough. No, we can't use a drone for that. I don't trust the numbers. Um, there's too much to manage from you know, the regulatory side or even just obtaining insurance. And so it re really requires somebody that, that can be that owner. And so if, if you're in a management position, I, I would say, you know, this can't be somebody's uh, just another thing on their plate. You really have to carve out some time for them to devote to this and actually manage it as a program. Um, understand the law. I mean, this one here is, is you know, the FAA, the, regu the regulatory environment in the U.S. is, you know, I, I think is very supportive of commercial drone use uh, today. And the, the law is constantly changing, as John mentioned. There's actually a big... Uh, FAA symposium this week in, in DC, and so there'll be some there'll be some new rules that will probably allow uh, you know new types of applications. But um, I'd say you know the other thing, if you're going to be that champion, it, at least you know go take your Part 107 or at least study for it and just understand you know what would an an operator, whether it's in house or third party. Um, one of the things I'll, I'll mention there is just. Uh, I've had reports of third-party contractors coming out. A lot of people say, oh, hey, I'm 107 certified pilot. 
They may have really no background in the mining industry, and maybe they did get their, um, their IMSHA certification, but are they actually flying under the constraints of your site, airspace constraints and other things? So just understanding the law to both monitor in-house, but also third parties is really important. Um, solicit input from stakeholders. I think, you know, John has seen this at, at Luckstone is, right, there's going to be a lot of groups that can benefit from this information. And um, so I think it really pays uh, dividends to go in early and meet with the different groups. Um, that is, whether they're folks that are really responsible for the production side of things or folks that are, are on the environmental or mine planning side and you know get buy-in. I think once uh, people see the information, uh, at least what we've seen with, with our customers, is they just start getting more and more requests for information. Can you do this? Can you do that? And so um, getting some input early around what are requirements for deliverables specifically is, is something that I, I truly believe in. Um, test drive your options. So there is a lot of options in this space, a lot of innovation, a lot of companies um, you know, bringing new technology to market. You can um, kind of do the roll your own or do a really low cost program with buying a, a uh, hovercraft, like a GGI hovercraft at Best Buy, and you can get uh, software that can do photogrammetry on a laptop computer, and you can do that relatively low cost. But uh, I think you know the, one of the drivers for Luxstone going with Airware was really around, yeah, they're collecting a lot more data in the field, but also those, there was a big cost as far as office time and processing and keeping up with that. And so I think understanding kind of some of the nuances around data processing is, is beneficial. And just understanding what your options are, whether you want to you know, do it in-house or whether you want to really go with a kind of like a service, uh, you know, cloud-based service, something like Airware. Um, and also your options on drones. I mean, we're happy to talk the hardware aspects of things. Uh, Airware, we don't make any hardware, drone hardware. We, we use off-the-shelf commercial products from primarily GGI and SenseFly is what we recommend. But we're happy to talk uh, through those options, are you? Because there are a lot of them on the market. But I, I think most people in, in this space for the type of work we're doing, surveying, mapping, and inspection work, kind of landed on a, on a couple uh, key hardware options. And then I think the other thing, too, is really understanding the field operation side. You may have no interest in actually being a drone pilot or flying the drone quite honestly. I mean, Doing it for uh, survey and mapping purposes, it flies autonomously now. It's so easy. It's actually kind of boring after a while. Um, at least that's my opinion. And but I think it's really important to understand the field operations side of things. And what this will do is help you create your standard operating procedures for your company. Because um, if you don't, then what happens when a hey, Bob, who's the pilot? leaves and he's the only one that knew how to do something. So I, I'm a big believer in having uh, documented standard, standard operating procedures that anybody uh, can look at and review. You're going to need them when you get insurance. Uh, it's one of the questionnaires that, uh, that will be whether you're an uh, insurance company like Chubb that insures a, a lot of aggregates facilities. They will ask you about your documented uh, operating procedures for, for using UAVs and do you have them. So uh, those are some of the, the lessons that I or you know, the getting started tips that I would impart. And uh, I think what we want to do now is just open it up for questions from the audience. And, and we're happy to field pretty much anything.